Thank you very much. Today, I'm excited to tell you about how we can keep America safe and secure throughout the 21st century moving forward. And I'll suggest that the way we do this is through continuing to maintain a robust strategic triad of nuclear weapons. And I'll talk more about exactly what that is here in a moment. I want to first mention, though, that these thoughts are my own. They don't represent anyone other than myself. So uh, no blame is due to the Air Force or Department of Defense or the US government. So we're going to talk first about what the strategic environment looks like in the 21st century, who our threats are, who the, and how these adversaries may uh, threaten us going forward. We'll then talk about what deterrence is and why it's so essential as a strategy, as an instrument of national policy. And then finally, I'll discuss efforts that we can undertake to make sure that we can continue to deter our adversaries moving forward. So first, let's talk about who our adversaries are and what they might be able to do to threaten us. So, I guess the, the, the first big point is that the same adversaries who have been posing a threat to us for decades now will continue to pose a threat into the future. And if anything, they will pose an increased threat, a larger threat, due to some of the investments that they're making in their own military capabilities. So for example, the Russians are modernizing their fleet of ballistic missiles. And by 2020, it's expected that the Russians will have replaced every single one of their missiles they had during the Soviet era. It will be a completely new arsenal. And this means that their missiles have modern technology. They're harder for our uh, early warning systems to see. And even if we could see them, they're harder to hit. They're harder to defend against overall in a way that may give the Russians an asymmetric advantage against us if we don't make our own investments. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. The Russians have also invested in their cruise missiles, their ability to shoot long range missiles out of aircraft. And they have a new missile called the KH-102 that there aren't many details about in open source literature, but there are some suggestions that this missile has the range such that it could be launched from Russian airspace and hit the United States. They don't even need to leave their own airspace to threaten us with their air launch cruise missiles. The Russians are also improving their own defenses. So not only are they getting better offensive capability, they're investing in defenses that will make it harder for us to hold assets at risk in a way that's required by deterrence. So they're um, investing in, in missiles like the S-400 and the S-500. And the S-500, which is still in development, according to Wikipedia, the mother of all sources, <laughs> may one day have the ability to shoot down a re-entry vehicle from one of our ballistic missiles as it's coming in from outer space through the atmosphere, going Mach really fast. So it, these are absolutely amazing capabilities that if gone unchecked, or if we don't invest in our own capabilities, may give the Russians a huge asymmetric advantage in military capability moving forward. The Chinese are also investing in the ability to uh, keep us at bay, to keep us at arm's length. So they have new anti-access weapons. They've got a ballistic missile called the DF-21D that can supposedly hit an aircraft carrier from a thousand miles offshore. And so think about what this does. It puts, it puts our military capabilities farther and farther and farther away from our adversaries in a way that would prevent us from being able to project power against our adversaries in the way that we've grown accustomed to. And so we need to figure out, as a country, how we can overcome these strategic challenges and continue to, um, to hold our adversaries' targets at risk. China is also investing in new submarine launched ballistic missiles. Up to this point, China's nuclear force, um, according to open source literature, was concentrated primarily in ground launched intercontinental ballistic missiles. Now they're buying submarines. So they're going to have that survivable second strike capability that comes with submarines that are hard to find. And so 
these are the um, enduring challenges that we face in the sense that they come from enduring adversaries who are simply updating and renewing their existing technology. Let's talk now about some new challenges, challenges that didn't exist 15 or 20 years ago um, at the end of the Cold War. We've got to deal with some new adversary or some adversaries who are developing or who may develop their own nuclear weapons. So North Korea, for example, has now conducted a series of nuclear tests and has also tested a or, um, some ballistic missiles and is thought to be actively working to mate these new warheads with the ballistic missiles in a way that will um, really challenge our ability to interact with the North Koreans. They'll be able to target potentially places like Japan and, if some reports are correct, even the continental United States. Big threat. Iran, currently we have the nuclear deal with Iran that we hope will slow, if not completely curb, their nuclear proliferation. But what happens in the future um, is, is anyone's guess at the moment. These threats, both from enduring adversaries as well as new adversaries or um, newly empowered adversaries, is putting strain on some of the alliances that have served as the bedrock of American foreign policy in some of the most important regions throughout the world. So some of the interactions with Russia in places like Ukraine are putting pressure on NATO. Uh, some of China's actions in the South China Sea are putting pressure on our relationships with countries like the Philippines, whose president said just the other day that after this next upcoming military exercise with the United States, they're done. Basically, the United States and the Philippines are no longer going to conduct joint exercises together, which is significant. We've also got to deal with cyber threats. And this, one of the most significant things about cyber is it shifts the ability to conduct uh, attacks on countries, strategic attacks on countries. It shifts that out of the domain of just countries and states and gives that power to non-state groups or even in some cases, potentially individuals. We also have to think about space. Um, China conducted an anti-satellite missile test in 2007. They shot a satellite out of orbit with a missile that was launched from the Earth. And this is a sign that space is only becoming more and more contested as a strategic environment. And then this, this doesn't count at all new emerging technologies, um, for example, hypersonics, which uh, operate, uh, operate in a way that will challenge existing ballistic missile and other air defenses. So it's a cha I, I hope kind of the message you're getting is that the 21st century is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, and we've got to be proactive as a country in our attempts to head off some of these threats. And I'll suggest that one, one thing that we need to do carefully is to think about deterrence and how, as the threat environment shifts, we can undertake steps, both in terms of the military forces that we buy and how we deploy them to ensure that we can maintain a robust and effective deterrent. So let me talk about what deterrence is. So according to the Department of Defense, deterrence is the prevention of action by the existence of a credible threat of unacceptable counteraction and or a belief that the cost of action outweigh the perceived benefits. So deterrence is about trying to get inside your adversary's head. And when they're weighing the costs and the benefits of a potential action, Deterrence is about making sure that those costs of undertaking a challenge to the status quo will always outweigh the benefits. And so now let's talk about how you do that and how we've done that over time up to this point. So one of the key problems or challenges with deterrence is that we want to deter so that we don't have to fight our adversary. You know, we, we want to prevent our adversary from making a challenge so that we don't have to repel that challenge through the use of force. Because the use of force, armed conflict, is costly. It's risky. It's something that all else held equal, we tend not to want to do. But deterrence only works if that unacceptable threat of counteraction, that promise to use force if our adversary doesn't heed our warning, if the adversary believes that that, that 
that we are going to be willing to fight to carry out that threat. So we want to deter so we don't have to fight, but deterrence only works if we can promise the adversary that we are willing to fight. So there's an inherent tension there that's been the subject of decades and decades now of study by scholars who, are, who do work on deterrence. And what we've kind of settled on, to the extent we've settled on anything, is that successful deterrence depends on credibility. That is, making the adversary think that when you say don't do this or else that you really mean it and that or else is a function of two different things so credibility is a function of two different components that i want to focus on as then we talk through the different military capabilities um, that we have for deterrence so the first element of credibility is capability that is the ability to actually go out and do what you're saying you're going to do you know, if, if I say, don't do this or I'm going to punch you with my arm, that's not a very effective threat if my arms are broken, right? So we have to demonstrate that we have the ability to go out and actually carry out the threat. This is why we work so hard to, say, test our missiles in a public way. We announce to the press that, hey, there's going to be a missile launch at X place at X time so that everyone knows and can come and watch it. We want the, everyone to see that we can hit a target 6,000 miles downrange in the way that we would if we ever had to go to war. I think the, set, the, the, the more challenging part though in generating credibility is the second component and that is resolve. How can we convince the adversary that we are willing to accept the risks and to pay the costs with carrying out a with carrying out the threat should it become necessary. And this is so tough because it's largely a political challenge. It's trying to say, well, yeah, we may have the capability, but we're also willing to use it, even if that means that you know, we may lose soldiers, we may lose other aspects of our national treasure that we really value. And so now that we've got credibility as a function of capability and resolve, I want to start talking through some of our capabilities, or excuse me, I want to start talking through some aspects of our military and how each affects the capability and resolve um, components of this equation. I'm going to do so in the context of strategic deterrence, and I'm focusing on strategic deterrence because this is kind of what, what keeps us safe at home every day. This is what makes sure that we can continue to drive down the street, to interact with each other in a way that is uninhibited by the threats from our adversaries. So it's, it's I guess you could say, the, the, big, the big picture part of deterrence. So I'll focus as well on the role that nuclear weapons play in ensuring strategic deterrence because when it comes to making sure that your adversary's perceived costs exceed the perceived benefits, nothing beats the speed and the sheer destructiveness of nuclear weapons in terms of shifting that, that cost equation. This is not to say, however, that there aren't other capabilities that have strategic implications or that are important. So um, certainly, as I've already discussed, cyberspace is an important new domain. Um, outer space is going to become increasingly important and some um, and deterrence in the conventional domain is also going to be quite important going forward but I'm going to focus uh, on nuclear weapons and so one thing that people say people who are critics of nu nuclear weapons is that they're an artifact of the Cold War we don't need them anymore we don't need a Cold War style arsenal and the first thing that I would say in response is that we don't have a Cold War style arsenal anymore so this is hard to see on um, the screen, but the y-axis here represents the number of warheads that the United States has or is thought to have had in its arsenal. And the x-axis represents time. So from here, in the days of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II, all the way to the present. And what you'll see is that in the late 60s, the United States had about 32,000 nuclear weapons. Today, our arsenal is thought to be less than 5,000 weapons, only 15, well, um, and it's going down to 1,550 strategic nuclear weapons as a result of a treaty we signed several years ago with Russia, and a much smaller number of what we call tactical weapons, most of which are thought to be 
deployed in Europe to help with NATO. So we have a tiny fraction of the arsenal that we had during the midst of the Cold War. And so to the people who say that, well, this is just you know, a relic of the Cold War, I'd say, no, it's not. We're already changing and adapting our arsenal to meet 21st century security threats. And one of the ways in which we're adapting is through modifying the components of the triad. And the nuclear triad, if you're not familiar, refers to the combination of aerial bombers, long-range strategic bombers, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and ground-based missiles, which we normally refer to as intercontinental ballistic missiles. And these three capabilities together Sometimes people think of them as substitutes or as redundant. We have, you know, th we have the ground-based missiles because, you know, that's better than just having submarine-based missiles, which is better than just having the air-based bombers. That these three things are basically the same in terms of their ability to put an adversary at risk. And so I'm going to I hope when you leave here today you'll understand why that's not true and why these three components of the triad actually provide different types of capability in a way that helps ensure effective deterrence. So the first need to ensure that deterrence is, uh, continues to be effective through the 21st century is to recapitalize our bomber force. So this is a B-52, and there are people who are currently flying these airplanes whose fathers flew the airplanes and whose fathers' fathers flew the airplanes. And when I say the airplanes, I'm not talking about, well, they flew B-52s in general. I'm literally referring to the same tail numbers, to the same exact aircraft. We stopped buying B-52s in the early 60s, and these are the planes um, you know, that we still depend on today in terms of projecting power against our adversaries. And I should say we've got about um, six, six to seven dozen B-52s left, and uh, only five, four to five dozen of those are thought to still possess the capability to drop nuclear weapons if necessary or to launch a nuclear-armed cruise missile. This is the other type of bomber we have that's capable of employing nuclear weapons. This is the B-2 Spirit, and it's great because it can go in and strike adversaries, and in some cases they don't even know it's there till, till things start blowing up. It is low observable, and that is going to be essential in the 21st century threat environment where our adversaries have exceptionally sophisticated aerial defenses. The problem with the B-2 is that we only have 18 of them that are in operational service. We just don't have the numbers needed to rely on the B-2 alone when it comes to strategic deterrence. But one of the reasons why both the B-2 and especially the B-52 are so important is because they are the one leg of the triad that we can send in a visible way all across the world to demonstrate how serious we might be about a particular issue. So this is a picture taken from Osan Air Force Base in South Korea of a B-52 that we flew along the demilitarized zone with North Korea in an attempt to demonstrate our resolve over a particular issue. So not only are we saying, hey, we have the capability to fly a strategic bomber right up to your borders, we're also saying that we have the willingness to do it in a way that we know everyone can see. So that is an attempt to generate that credibility that I was referring to earlier. And so we've got B-52s, but they're very old. They're not very survivable in a modern, highly contested threat environment. And we don't have enough, yeah, so, so we don't have enough B-2s, and the B-52s aren't likely to be, to be survivable. So what do we need? Well, one thing that the Air Force is working on right now in cooperation with Northrop Grumman is the B-21 Raider. It was actually just named a week or two ago. And this is going to be a 21st century bomber for 21st century threats. 
So the B-21, of which we still know very little about in public, is going to be low observable like the B-2, but it's going to be affordable to the point where we can buy enough bombers to have the capability to put at risk our adversaries who have these intense threat defenses. We're not going to be relying on a dozen and a half bombers alone. So it's going to be very important. And this is a program that's currently being debated in Congress that you may have seen in the news. One thing that we also, or I shouldn't say we, one of the things that the Air Force is also looking to do is since we have these B-52s that are already bought and paid for, that we already have in the inventory, we want to figure out how we can still use them in a highly contested threat environment. And one of the thoughts is, well, if you can simply put a B-52 you know, out beyond the adversary's defenses, but have a weapon that can launch into the adversary's defenses effectively, then the B-52 still has a lot of utility. So this is an AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile. This is currently what we have in the inventory, but um, the thought is that it may be a bit too slow, it's not stealthy, it's going to be vulnerable to our adversary's air defenses. And so this may not be the weapon that allows the B-52s to play an effective part in the 21st century. So what do we need instead? Well, maybe we could take or maybe we could use our 21st century technology and design a new cruise missile that would serve the same role as this AGM-86, but would give us more and better capability, the type of capability we're going to need. And that is, um, if you follow um, the defense news, this has been a very hotly debated topic. It's called the Long Range Standoff Weapon, or LRSO. And critics of nuclear weapons of our strategic arsenal are going after it very hard, both in op-eds written in venues like the New York Times and also through testimony to Congress and in, um, in other ways. So this is the, the last element of the air-based leg of the triad that I'll talk about. And this is uh, what we call a, a B-61 Mod 12. So the, B-61 has been around for a while. In fact, the 61 is the year in which it was designed. It is an exceptionally old weapon. And so what the US has done is they've taken this exceptionally old weapon and they've gone through and they've added 21st century parts to it to extend the life of these existing, existing bombs. And they've also put, at the end, you can't really see, a tail kit on it that makes it more accurate. And the idea with accuracy in nuclear weapons is that the more accurate the weapon is, the smaller the blast needs to be. So if we can employ a weapon that, or field a weapon that is more accurate, we don't need to increase the tonnage, the, the yield of the bomb. And that may have certain benefits um, if we need to put an adversary at risk. Say we want to attack a certain target, but we don't want to generate a lot of radiation or fallout this is a weapon that will provide us better capability. And it also has the ability for um, users to change how much of a blast there is by adjusting it on the weapon itself, rather than having to send it back and redo the physics that are inside of the bomb. So it's another important piece. The second need we have is to revitalize the subs, the submarines. And this has less to do with the lack of capability in the existing submarines, but more because submarines are just like an aluminum can, and every time you submerge them, they get squeezed, that hole gets squeezed. And over time, if you, they don't, you, you can only squeeze them so much. And so our existing Ohio-class ballistic missile submarines are nearing the end of their effective service life, simply because they've made so many cycles up and down. And we've absolutely got to keep the subs because they're hard to find. They ensure that for our adversaries who, are, who may seek to disarm us, that there's likely going to be a sub or two out there that can, if ordered, launch retaliatory strikes. So subs, whereas the bombers were so effective, because they are visible and they can be seen as instruments of national power, subs are so effective because they're stealthy. 
and they're hard to see and they always make the adversary feel in the back of his head that maybe I won't get the submarines. And with an Ohio class ballistic missile submarine that has 20 nuclear tipped ballistic missiles on it, that's a pretty big risk for the adversary to take if they don't know where the submarines are. One of the challenges though with the submarines from a strategic perspective is that once they start launching their missiles, they're no longer stealthy. And so from, from, a, pers from a flexibility perspective, we want, capabili or we want capabilities to say launch one or two or three um, weapons, whatever is required, and still save the rest for later use. But with a submarine, if you're launching a missile or two and the adversary knows where you are, then you may not have those missiles to use later, later in the conflict. And so that's why submarines are great, um, great for making sure that there's still at least some retaliatory capability there, but they're not as good as some of the other, or the other two legs of the triad when it comes to how finely you're able to meter the use of the weapons. And so the, um, the Ohio class replacement program is funded through Congress and is currently in development. And um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see over the next few years um, exactly what happens in terms of that program. So the last need, and in some ways, I think that this is the most important need, is to revitalize our complement of land-based strategic missiles, these intercontinental ballistic missiles, the ICBMs. And ICBMs are so vital because even though our newest ICBM was put in the ground in 1973, they still have two key strategic characteristics that the other legs of the triad lack. And the first is that if, an ad, if we didn't have the ICBMs spread out throughout the northwestern United States, our adversaries would only have to worry about attacking a small number of targets in a disarming first strike. They could go after the two submarine bases. They could go after the, the three strategic bomber bases or wherever else they might think the strategic bombers were. They could probably, you know, just think about going after Offutt Air Force Base where U.S. Strategic Command is. But because we have more than 400 ICBMs and a smaller number of launch control centers spread out over hundreds of square miles of American soil, the adversary has to spend so many of their weapons trying in a first strike to disarm our ability to hit them back. And one of the reasons why making sure that our adversaries have to target our missiles is important is because, so this is a launch facility right here with a Minuteman III inside, presumably, and there's Farmer John's house. To target, and to target our ICBMs, to remove their ability to retaliate for a first strike, would require an adversary to use nuclear weapons against us on American soil. And that would generate an imperative a political imperative for a response such that an adversary could be almost certain that a first strike against the United States would result in a massive nuclear counterstrike. And that's not, you know, in terms of talking about costs and benefits, that's really shifting the costs above the benefits when an adversary is thinking about whether they should strike the United States or not. And so this is actually a picture of a Peacekeeper missile, which is no longer online. But one of the things that we need to do with our ICBMs is to update them. Like I said, the newest one was put into the ground in the early 70s. The uh, supporting infrastructure is roughly the same age. And it's just not the type of infrastructure we need going forward in the 21st century. So this new program called the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrent, or GBSD for short, is going to both include a new missile and also a new supporting infrastructure to include better, more effective nuclear command control and communication such that if we are attacked, we will still be able to communicate in a way that will allow us to launch and return.
And so I've talked about a lot of new programs, a lot of new weapons, and of course, the United States right now is not exactly flush for money. So how much is this going to cost, and are these costs worthwhile? I'll suggest that they are. So nuclear critics like to say that the cost of recapitalizing the nuclear enterprise will be $1 trillion. They call it the trillion dollar triad, which is kind of catchy, right? So let's take, let's take for a moment um, them at their word that it's going to cost $1 trillion. Lots of estimates suggest less, but let's take their high estimate. That's $33 billion a year. Of course, we're not going to spend the same amount every year. In fact, on this chart you can see here's um, the number of million dollars. This is $50 million. And these are the years, and we're about right here on the chart. I apologize for the lack of clarity. So you can see that during the end of the Cold War, we were spending quite a bit on nuclear weapons. And then at the end of the Cold War, we took the peace dividend. We stopped updating our stuff. And now that we're getting to this point, we need to capitalize the subs, the bombers, and the ICBMs, all three legs of the triad. We're going to have to pay a lot. And so at some years, we're going, or we're expected to pay north of $40 million a year. But like any expensive purchase, we'll, we'll finance it out into the future. So if you'll allow me to assume that we'll spend roughly $33 billion a year, I'd like to put the cost in perspective. So $33 billion a year is roughly $106 an American. You know, and that's maybe still, still quite a bit of money, but I'll suggest that we spend $245 a year on soft drinks, $94 on candy, $158 on credit card interest, and $532 on wasted food alone. And so, yeah, we're talking about $106 a year, but we're talking about the capabilities to ensure that Americans stay safe and secure throughout the 21st century and likely beyond. Now, isn't that worth drinking half as many soft drinks to pay for it? I'd suggest that it is. And so with that, I'll summarize. So we talked about what some of the new threats are from both enduring opponents as well as new opponents, what deterrence was as a concept, and then some of the steps that we're taking to revitalize our nuclear enterprise, which is that bedrock of our strategic deterrent. 